All participants, please stand by. Your meeting is now ready to begin. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the BRP's Q2 Fiscal Year 2021 Earnings Call. I would now like to turn the meeting over to Mr. Philippe Deschain. Please go ahead, Mr. Deschain. Thank you, Julie. Good morning and welcome to BRP's conference call for a second quarter of fiscal year 21. Joining me this morning are Jose Boisjoli, President and Chief Executive Officer, <coughs> and Sébastien Martel, Chief Financial Officer. Before we move to the prepared remarks, I would like to remind everyone that certain forward-looking statements will be made during the call that are subject to a number of risks and uncertainties. I invite you to read BRP's MDNA for a listing of these. Also during the call, reference will be made to supporting slides and you can find the presentation on our website at brp.com under the Investor Relations section. So with that, I'll turn the call over to Jose. Thank you, Philip. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Before I talk about our result this quarter, allow me to say that in this unusual year, I'm extremely proud of the effort of our people and our dealers in reacting with agility in order to respond to the crisis and preserve our business momentum. Our results this quarter are significantly better than our original projection that we made when the pandemic was first declared and confinement measures were put in place. We were, we were in an excellent position heading into this situation and we will emerge stronger from this crisis. Based on our revised projection and better visibility, we are expecting revenue down 5 to 9% for the year and a normalized EPS range of $3.65 to $3.95 for the year. The range is quite large because of the uncertainties we are still facing. Let's start with the highlight of the quarter, beginning with the financial result on slide four. Although most of our sites were shut down in April and May, our revenue came in much better than expected at $1.2 billion, only down 15% from last year's second quarter. Our normalized EBITDA ended the quarter up 28% to $214 million, resulting in a normalized earning per share of $1.14, up 61% over last year. This performance was driven by stronger than expected demand for our product and parts, accessories, and apparel that drove retail worldwide. This had led us to deplete our yard inventory and reduce our promotional activity more than we had anticipated. Our operational expenses were reduced as planned. The highlight of the quarter was the strength of the demand for our products. As you know, we have steadily been increasing market share for the last several quarters. We started Q1 with a strong retail momentum and our inventory was positioned to sustain that trend. However, given the exceptionally high demand for our product and the production shutdown, we ended up depleting our inventory quickly in the quarter and therefore lost some market share. Our analysis shows that as travel options were limited and people began to rethink how they will spend their free time, many have turned to power sport as a way to spend quality time with friends and family while respecting social distancing guidelines. This trend led to exceptional retail performance in all our key markets and all across our product lines. Our retail sales were up 40% in North America, 41% in EMEA, 34% in Asia Pacific, and 27% in Latin America. As you can see on the slide, all product line had significant growth. Let's talk about the impact of the forced closure of our plan on inventory. As you can see on this slide, our North American dealer inventory was down 51% at the end of July, and our finished good inventory in our warehouse and in transit around the world was down 38%. To illustrate how fast this depletion happened, take a look at the graph to the right. Side-by-side -side inventory declined in May and June as retail ramp up, and we felt the impact of the suspension of our production lines from the previous months. For personal watercraft, the effect is even more drastic. Inventory was very low in June and July, ending the season with almost no sea-do available 
due to the popularity of our brand. Given the strong retail trend, we expect it could take several quarters before we get back to optimal inventory level. Our team have done an incredible job of quickly ramping up production in this new environment. Our focus is on managing the growth throughout our operation while ensuring that we preserve the health and safety of our employee and our business partner. The strong retail demand in all our product line was in part driven by a significantly higher number of new entrants to the industry. Early in August, we conducted a global study with customers in seven countries who have purchased units during the quarter and the results are phenomenal. As you can see on this slide, when looking at our retail sales, 77% of our power sport customer purchased from BRP for the first time, representing an increase of 51% over the same quarter last year. By product line, it represents 74% for ORV, 65% for three-wheel vehicle, and 32% for personal watercraft. Of these new customers, 41% were completely new to the power sport industry. This represents almost three times the number of new entrants we had over the same period last year. These results are very impressive and present a very good opportunity to grow our business. Our focus is to ensure that the surge of new entrants is converted into lifelong customers. Now let's turn to slide eight for the year-round product highlight. Revenue were down 15% due to the temporary shutdown of our production site, partially offset by a favorable product mix for three-wheel vehicle, driven by the introduction of the new Spider RT and by lower sales program. On the retail side, the North American side-by-side -side industry ended its season 20 on June 30th with retail up low 20%. Canam side by side had another very strong season with retail up low 40%, solidifying our number two market share position in the industry. We also performed well in the international market with retail for the quarter up almost 50% in EME and up about 30% in Asia Pacific. Now, not even five years after the opening of ULIS2 facility, we have tripled the size of our the size of our side by side business and our momentum remains very strong. To ensure we can maintain that momentum, we have announced the construction of a second plan dedicated to side by side in URIs. This new plan will grow our capacity by about fifty percent and is expected to be operational by fall of twenty twenty one. Turning to ATV. The North American ETV industry also ended its season 20 on June 30th with retail up high teen percentage. For the same period, our retail was up low 20% and ended the season with the number three market share position in North America. Our ETV business also performed well in international market with retail up over 30% in Asia Pacific and over 50% in EME. Now looking at three-wheel vehicles. After a slow start to the season, due to the closure of riding school and license bureaus, and consequently the major readjustment of our marketing plans, when the situation turned around, our three-wheel vehicle retail picked up significantly, starting in June and has continued through the summer. Looking at the industry, Nine months into season 20, the North American three-wheel vehicle industry retail is now up high single digit, while Canam retail is up low teen percent, with June and July performing significantly better than expected, and retail up over 90% over as riding school reopened. We are planning a virtual launch of new Canam products on October 1st. Overall, we are very happy with our Canam business. Turning to seasonal product on slide nine. Seasonal product revenue were down 25%, impacted by temporary production suspension and a negative product mix for personal watercraft, 
which were partially offset by lower sales program. Now looking at retail, the personal watercraft industry also benefited from the strong consumer demand for outdoor activity that are compatible with social distancing. 10 months into season 20, North American industry retail is up mid teen percentage. Sea to personal watercraft retail was slow in April and May and then took off in June. As a result, retail is also up mid teen percentage over the same period, notably gaining share in the industry largest segment with the new SIDU GTI platform in the recreational segment. Given production constraint and the very strong re retail demand, SIDU currently has its lowest level of network inventory in its history. The same positive trend was also seen in the international market with retail up for the quarter in the high 30% in Latin America and mid 40% in EMEA and Asia Pacific. On September 10, we are hosting a virtual product launch for all our dealers worldwide with some exciting personal watercraft product news. We believe that the demand for next season will continue to be strong. With respect to snowmobile, we are still very early in the season, but retail is already up 70%. We believe it is due to the same trend that have benefited our other product lines. We are now in full production and will be able to meet dealer orders and have more units if the condition warranted. Continuing with a look at power sport parts, accessories and apparel and OEM engines. Revenue were up 20% driven by a higher volume of PA and A coming from strong unit retail sales and higher replacement parts revenue driven by an increased usage of product by consumers. Parts are up over 20%, accessories are up over 30%, and apparel is up over 40% compared to last year. The same trend affecting vehicle sales apply to these categories. Finally, looking at our marine business, Compare year-over-year, -year, revenue, were, revenue were down 35% due to the wind-down of even road outboard engine, and inventory is depleting faster than planned, as retail is also performing well. These results were partially offset by the impact of the additional revenues from the acquisition of Tailwater last year. At the retail level, Alumacraft is up high teens percentage, Manitou is up high 30%, and Tellwater is up high 20%. The current phenomenon of getting outdoor is also helping our boat brands. We are progressing well with our discontinuation plan for outboard engine and remain committed to our marine buy, build, transform strategy, which we are pleased to say is on track. We remain convinced that our best strategy is to focus our marine business on the growth of our boat brand with accelerated investment on new technology and innovative product, including the Ghost Engine family. With that, I will turn the call to Sebastian. Thank you, Jose, and good morning, everyone. As Jose mentioned, our second quarter results came in much stronger than we were anticipating just three months ago, driven by the exceptionally strong worldwide demand for our products throughout the quarter. Our revenues ended the quarter at $1.2 billion, a decline of only 16% from last year, despite the significant impact from the production shutdown. Our normalized dividend was up 28% to $214 million, driven by improved adjusted gross profit margin and lower operating expense as a result of the cost-saving measures we have implemented to preserve liquidity given the uncertain environment we were operating in just a few months ago. This resulted in normalized DPS of $1.14, up 61% from last year's. These better than anticipated results, coupled with the significant efforts deployed by our teams to preserve liquidity, led to the generation of $248 million of free cash flow so far this year. And with over $900 million of additional financing we secured this quarter, we stand in a very solid financial position with about $1.1 billion of cash on the balance sheet. 
While we remain cautious about the current environment, our solid financial flexibility is providing us with the ability to be opportunistic and accelerate investments in the business to drive long-term growth for the company, as highlighted by the recently announced construction of a new side-by-side plant. Coming back to our revenue performance, our ability to generate growth in certain markets was driven by the inventory availability in our yard. At International, we started the quarter with a good inventory position, given that the region was more impacted by COVID during the first quarters, with revenues down 29%. As the region rebounded with strong retail demand, we were able to ship units from inventory and generate revenue growth of 15% for the quarter, despite the production shutdown. The story was quite different in North America. We started the quarter with lean inventory position in the yard, and we continued running lean all quarter despite resuming production as retail demand continued to be very strong. I will come back later with the outlook on how we expect to fulfill demand for our products going forward. Our inventory of parts, accessories, and apparel was in a better position, allowing us to seize the market strength and deliver revenue growth of 20%, driven by strong retail momentum and increased consumer usage of their products. Now looking in more detail at the gross profit margin on slide 15. We gained 230 basis points of gross profit margin coming from volume, mix, pricing, and sales programs in the quarter. Foreign exchange rate variations were also positive for 40 basis points, leading to a gross profit margin before the impact of ever renewed outboard engines wind down and COVID of 25.2%. The ever renewed wind down had a negative impact of 330 basis points and COVID, probably due to the temporary production shutdown and underabsorption of fixed costs, had a net negative impact of 180 basis points. Turning to slide 16. Our quarterly normalized in income was up $32 million from last year, driven by a $75 million favorable impact coming from lower operating expenses, resulting from the cost-saving initiatives we have implemented, and a favorable $8 million impact from foreign exchange. These elements were partly offset by the negative impacts of $41 million coming from volume, mix, pricing and sales programs, $3 million coming from production costs and depreciation, and $7 million coming from higher financing costs. Turning to slide 17 for a look at our network inventory position. As Jose mentioned, our North American network inventory is down 51% from last year's second quarter, as we experienced exceptionally strong demand for products since late April, while our unit output was limited by temporary production suspension in April and May. The products that were the most impacted by this situation were SSV, ATV, and PWC, given the timing of the production shutdown and the retail growth. Inventory for these products is historically low, and to ensure that we meet demand, we have added production shifts and increased line speed. Looking further, the second dedicated facility to SSV we recently announced should provide us with greater flexibility for that product line when it comes online in the fall of 2021. As for PWC, we also plan on extending our production schedule, which will increase shipments in H1 of fiscal year 22. For three-wheel, we were able to produce additional units in June, and given that retail only accelerated later in the summer, the inventory is adequate, and we are maintaining our initial production plans for next season. Finally, for snowmobile, given the current trend for power sport products, we are anticipating that demand may come in higher than our initial plan, and we have extended our production schedule, providing us with the flexibility of increasing output to meet demand if required. We are pleased by the strength of demand for our products. We gained market share when inventory for our product was available, and we are convinced that as we build back inventory and sustain our fast pace of product introductions, that we will continue outpacing our industry. And now the guidance on slide 18. With both network and our yard inventory being at historically low levels and the solid trend that power sport products continue to experience, we have good visibility on the demand for products for the rest of the year and are comfortable issuing guidance. Looking at revenues, we expect year-round products to be flat to down 4% for the year, implying revenues for the second half of the year to be flat to up 7%, driven by growth in SSV and ATV partly offset by a decrease in three-wheel due to a change in timing timing of production, leading to shipments being more concentrated into H1 of next year, and lower wholesale and international driven by product availability. 
For seasonal products, revenues for the year are expected to be down 12 to 15 percent. When looking at the second half, PwC is expected to be down. The increased production for the upcoming season will mostly benefit next year, and we expect snowmobile to be down, driven by lower shipments in international markets. Power sports, parts, accessories, and apparel revenues are, ex- are expected to be flat to up 5% for the year. And marine revenues are expected to be down 25 to 30%, with a decline resulting from the outboard engine business wind down. This is resulting in total company revenues that are expected to be down 5 to 9%. The normalized EBITDA is planned to be flat to up 5%, and the normalized DPS to end between 365 to 395, down 5 to up 3% versus last year. Our guidance range is wider than usual for this time of the year, as we still face uncertainties related to the COVID. While we have put in place strong measures to protect our employees, we are not immune to the potential risk that the virus could represent on the economy, our dealers, and our suppliers, which could lead to reduced demand, lower production, or increased costs, hence the wider range. In terms of capital allocation, our priorities remain on investing for future growth and preserving liquidity for what may lie ahead. For fiscal 21, we are expecting CapEx to be between 275 and $300 million, with over $200 million to be spent in the back half of the year, notably as we are ramping up the new SSV facility and continue to invest in product development. As for other capital allocation priorities, given the current context, we believe that preserving the strength of our balance sheet should be our priority, and we plan on revisiting capital deployment alternatives, such as reinstating buybacks for the dividend after the third quarter. Finally, turning to slide 19 for an overview of our expectations for H2. Revenues for the second half of the year are expected to be flat to down 7% as a stronger demand for products is expected to be offset by production timing, notably as we shift a higher proportion of PWC and three-wheel production into fiscal 22 for the future retail season, lower wholesale and international markets as yard and in-transit inventory is very low going into Q3, and we expect it will take a few quarters to get back to more normalized levels, and lower outboard engine revenue resulting from the wind down of a week. For the normalized EBITDA is expected to be down 5 to up 4%, with Q4 coming in slightly stronger than Q3. The key drivers in the back half of the year are expected to be a contribution from the stronger demand for products and the wind down of Evinwood outboard engines, which will somewhat offset by other elements highlighted previously in an increase in operating expenses as we resume certain investments in the business given the positive momentum we are experiencing. All in all, in light of the current environment, we expect a solid second half of the year and expect the momentum to continue well into next year when factoring the shift of personal watercraft and three-wheel production to next year, the need to replenish dealer inventory around the world and the new SSV plant, which will come online in the fall of next year. With this, I'll turn the call back to Jose. Thank you, Sebastian. We have been fortunate in the current context that despite the real hardship for many people, the demand for our product is high. We anticipate that for a certain period of time, we will need to continue to manage risks, such as answering health and safety in our facilities and potential disruption to our supply chain. I would like to again express my gratitude and admiration to our dealers for their resilience and for our employees who have gone the extra mile in respecting all the additional health and safety measures we have put in place. This has been and will continue to be critical to our business continuity. We are pleased with the performance of all our product line and the progress we have made on our different initiatives. Based on the overall momentum we are experiencing, the new trends that have emerged and our expanded consumer base, we are expecting the second half of the year to be similar to last year and it bode well for the year ahead. We are committed to ensuring that these new entrants and first time owners are converted into lifelong customers once they have experienced our vehicle and boats. Although we expect there will be a lot of volatility in the next few months, 
In the mid to long term, we believe that we are better positioned than ever for success. And on that note, I will turn the call over to the operator for questions. Thank you. Please press star one at this time if you have a question. There will be a brief pause while the participants register for questions. We thank you for your patience. The first question is from Steve Arthur from RBC Capital Markets. Your line is open. Please go ahead. Great. Thank you, and, uh, and good morning. Um, just wondering if you can elaborate a little bit more on the current status of the operations at your plants. Um, just some sense of what level of utilization you're running at now and how much of an impact the local health measures are having, in particular in Mexico, and I guess finally just how the utilization should trend through the balance of the year. Good morning, Steve. Uh, all operations right now are running at full capacity, and we are able to operate without any efficiency loss uh, everywhere in the world. Then we're quite happy, and I'm very, very uh, impressed with uh, our people who accept uh, to put a lot of safety measure and uh, the health care measure uh, and operate uh, efficiently in this whole context. That's remarkable. So in terms of adding uh, new shifts and new lines and such, is that, you know, on top of what you're doing now, or is that 100% reflective of those additions? No, it's, uh, I mean, we're running right now at full capacity everywhere. Then mm -hmm. uh, obviously if, uh, I mean, we expect to have some uh, here and there uh, difficulty with supplier, tight delivery, tight delivery or stuff like that, but this is thing that we can manage. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, like Sebastian explained in the guidance, uh, we, we can uh, we can overcome some small difficulty. Obviously, if there would be a whole uh, reconfinement in uh, in a country around the world, that would be more difficult. But uh, very very happy with the way our people are operating our our operations. Okay. And just a, a final one. Just you know, very interesting your survey of customers and and new customers in particular, 40% new to power sports. Uh, I guess on that, has there been an active marketing effort so far trying to attract these people, or is that just a, a natural flow of people looking for, for new things this summer? And I guess no, as a kid, look, looking yeah. ahead. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, definitely. When, we, when all of this started uh, and we saw the surge of new uh, demand, uh, we've done a, a detailed survey in March, and we've done another one uh, beginning of August. And basically, uh, to better understand who is buying and try to talk to them uh, directly and encourage them to try our product. And obviously, for competitive reason, I cannot give you all the detail of our plan, but obviously, we are in contact more and more with new customers, uh, knowing who they are, uh, trying to promote the experience uh, they could have with our product. And just an example, in July, we've launched an initiative called the Uncharter Society. Uh, if you go on our website at brpunchartersociety.com, you will see we partner with a lot of operators in North America. We believe we partner with the best into the industry, offering safe and uh, safe ride and high quality. But right now, I mean, you can book a snowmobile uh, ride uh, in uh, in the Rocky Mountain in Utah, uh, you could uh, we have a ride for women on road ride in San Gabriel Mountain in California with the Riker. One of my favorite is a dad and kiddos adventure in the Grand Canyon, Arizona. Then we're trying obviously to do cross sell between consumer. If someone purchase a side by side, we're trying to promote those tour that at least they can try a watercraft or a snowmobile in the winter. Uh, but I can tell you our, our marketing people are extremely uh, uh, active to try to talk to those customers and try to make them lifetime uh, customers. Good stuff. Thank you, and uh, congrats again. Thank you. Thank you. The next question comes from Mark Petrie from CIBC. Your line is open. Please go ahead. Yeah, good morning, and congrats on the excellent uh, the excellent results. 
I just wanted to ask a bit more, um, just to follow up on the on the outlook for snowmobiles. Wondering if you could just uh, you ran through a lot of uh, a lot of statistics there, and just wondering if you could sort of summarize uh, the uh, the production capacity right now. Uh, I know inventories are lower at the dealer level, uh, but do you expect that to be sort of normalized in the coming months? And and just sort of an overview of uh, of, the, of the outlook for snowmobiles for this season, please. Good morning, Mark. But first, the snowmobile season ended very quickly uh, mid-March last year. If you remember, most of the trail system were closed mid-March uh, because of uh, government uh, regulation. Then we ended the season, I, all the OEM ended the season with more inventory than uh, previous year. And uh, we took orders from our dealers in April, in the middle of uh, the crisis. And uh, we started, in our case, in, in Valcourt and in Finland, we started production a bit later than originally planned because we needed to produce some three-wheel vehicle uh, in May and June. Then right now, we are scheduled in both of our factory in Finland and in, in, in Valcourt to run a full capacity till uh, Christmas time. We have capacity to meet uh, the order that uh, we took from the dealers. And like Seb, Seb said on his, uh, on his intro, uh, we have some capacity to add on uh, if uh, there will be a demand from a dealer. We'll follow the trend closely uh, in October, November, and we, we plan uh, some material to be able to react quickly if there is a need. Okay, thanks for that. And just from a, from a competitive standpoint, in terms of marketing and promotion, um, I understand sort of early on you guys were um, fairly aggressive in terms of marketing and, and some of your promotions and financing deals. When did those get ratcheted back? And then how are you, or how, what's your expectation for how the industry is going to approach the snowmobile, uh, the snowmobile season? Yeah, for over, uh, good morning, Mark. Overall, uh, in, we, we ended the first quarter a bit more up, uh, cautious in our planning for retail, and so uh, we had provided for some programs, uh, but these programs were not needed, especially that the retail was very strong, and when you look at next season, there's less non-current inventory. Uh, and so where the way we look at the second half of the year, we, uh, we believe that promotions will be a, a tailwind to our results. Um, there'll be a, a lesser of a need for uh, for retail incentives, uh, less non-current as well. So it, it should be a positive element, and that's factored into our guidance number. Okay, appreciate the comments. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Benoit Poirier from Desjardins Capital Markets. Your line is open. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much, and congratulations for uh, the, the uh, very impressive quarter. So, Jose, could you mention some color on how the, uh, the does the pandemic impact your five-year plan? Uh, I was wondering whether it postponed some product introduction or uh, it uh, put in advance some product introduction translating uh, into a bigger market, especially with the new entrants coming to the power sport uh, industry. Uh, good morning, Benoit. Uh, for sure, uh, when everything shut down uh, in March, uh, and it was shut down for two months, we had to tweak a bit uh, our our uh, R&D effort and our product uh, planning. But the the essence of what uh, we believe will make a big difference in the industry have not changed. Then overall, uh, all the program uh, going from model year 20 to 21 this year. Uh, are ongoing uh, as planned. Uh, there is a few tweaking here, here and there, but uh, some shift, maybe a month or two, but nothing, uh, nothing, uh, nothing that we believe will affect uh, our five-year plan. To be honest, I'm very impressed. Uh, you know, the working from home, how we were able to be efficient in this whole context, because obviously there is things that are easier to do by phone, but there is when, when you talk about product development, you need to touch and feel, try. It's a bit more complicated, and the team have done an incredible job to pull it off. Then no change on the five-year plan. Okay. 
And with respect to capital deployment opportunities, you're going to be revisiting the NCIB and dividend with the third quarter results. But uh, given the, the new plan built in Mexico, could you talk a little bit about the uh, uh, the, the working capital movement expected in the second half and maybe some color about CapEx expected uh, for fiscal 22? Yeah, good, uh, good morning, Ben. <clears throat> first half of the year, we generated solid free cash flow uh, coming from, obviously, the good results. Working capital was a positive as well with the inventory reduction and AR that we collected. Back half of the year, I'm expecting inventory to rebuild, AR to rebuild. Uh, we'll, we'll offset some of that from the accounts payable. So uh, probably cash gen, free cash flow gen of probably, let's say, $100 million for the back half of the year. CapEx, as you see, back half of the year is going to be very uh, loaded with about $200 million of investment. Obviously, when the crisis started, we, we adjusted some of our plans for this year, and so CapEx is lower than what we were expecting when we were looking at our budgets, and let's say, back in January when there was very little talk of COVID. Obviously, some of that is going to be pushed to next year, so I'm expecting next year to be pretty uh, an important year in terms of investments. Obviously, we have side-by-side -side plans that we're investing in and more investments. So uh, it will be a record year in terms of CapEx investments uh, for uh, for 22. Okay. And last question for me. When we look at slide 15 with respect to uh, the gross margin, uh, you quantify the impact of the uh, Evan Rood outboard engine wind down and also the COVID-19. I would just be curious uh, what we should expect in the, if there's any more uh, costs with respect to Evan Rood wind down and COVID-19 impact uh, for the second half. Very, uh, very little cost related to the wind down. We took all of that in the in the first quarter, in the, some in the first, and most of it in the second. In terms of uh, we'll call it the cash costs. Uh, when I look at the back half of the year or the full year, you see my normalized dividend margin there. It should improve by 130 to 140 basis points just based on the guidance. What's going to be driving that improvement? About 50 basis points from operating expense, and the rest will be uh, coming from margin. Uh, by the way. Okay, perfect. And for the full year, right? The 130 yes. to yes. 150? Yes. Okay, for, thank you very much for the time, uh, gentlemen. Thanks. Thank you. The next question is from Robin Farley from UBS. Your line is open. Please go ahead. Great. Uh, thank you. Um, just trying to think about um, the dealer inventory declining while retail rising and, and those charts you had. I, I wonder if you can give us um, a little bit of color on kind of the, the rate of change in that retail through June, July, and, and kind of what you've seen now with, with most of August done. Um, and then if you can help us think about, um, is there a cap just sort of mathematically on where retail for you could go in Q3 based on, you know, what we see as, you know, fairly depleted dealer inventories. There's sort of a natural cap that even though you're, you're at full capacity everywhere, based on what you're able to ship and uh, where dealer inventory is that, you know, we shouldn't expect, you know, d despite what, you know, maybe strong demand is there just kind of a natural cap in that near term. Thank you. Uh, yeah, good morning, Robin. Uh, obviously, yes, the retail decline, uh, well, the retail was very strong in the beginning of the quarter, and, and that retail growth slowed down as, our, as we saw our inventory go down. Uh, <coughs> August is still very good. Uh, I'll remind you that Q3 of last year was a very, very strong quarter in terms of retail, especially in the month of August. Uh, despite that, despite the low inventory, we're, we're still up on retail. Uh, for our ORV business. Obviously, as Josie mentioned, the inventory for PwC is super, super lean, and so retail in, the, in August is down. When I look at Q3 and the expectation for retail, I'm expect, I'm not, a, there's a certain ceiling, yes, to, to what the retail could be. Uh, with low inventory and personal watercraft, snowmobile shipments that are a bit later than last year, uh, we expect good retail, um, but um, not to the level where it was last year in terms of retail growth because of the whole inventory situation. And as we go into Q4, as the inventory gets replenished, uh, we should see retail pick up. 
but for us, and as I mentioned in my prepared remarks, a lot of the units that we pr will be producing, especially for personal watercraft and three-wheel, will be shipped next year, and that's when we'll come back to more normalized inventory levels. Uh, so it'll take a few quarters before we, uh, we stabilize the inventory in the network. Okay, and just to um, thank you for that, uh, and just make sure I understood, um, you were saying snow is shipping later and personal watercraft inventory is super lean, and you said so retail would be lower there. Um, you're saying retail down there just for the seasonal, but not, not for year round. Correct? Not for year round, though. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, okay, and um, I, I guess are you at the point? Um, where you're starting to see retail be able, and I guess I'm thinking specifically of off-road or, or year-round here, where you're actually able to see retail levels start to accelerate a little bit as you ship more, or, or not not at that point yet? Well, it's still early. I mean, we've uh, inventory. I mean, the retail is still up, and so we're still at very lean inventory levels in the network. Uh, as I said, it'll take a few quarters before we come back to more normalized levels. And when I say a few quarters, that's next year, fiscal year 22, when we when we uh, have the new plant running. Uh, and so our expectation, when I look at the inventory outlook in the network for Q3 and Q4, I'm, I'm still expecting it down to it to be down significantly year over year at the end of Q3 and Q4. But but maybe to give some colors, <clears throat> last year. Uh, like Sebastian mentioned, last year in August, just to give you some numbers, uh, if I exclude watercraft to do the comparison because we don't have any watercraft this year, but last year in August, our retail between all product line except watercraft was up about 40%. And right now, so far in August, we are up, excluding watercraft again, a bit higher than 20%. And that's despite we're not optimum in inventory in some product line. Then we believe the demand will be there. We believe every OEM is, is uh, struggling with, uh, with uh, defiling uh, the inventory. But the demand is there, no doubt about that. Okay, that's great. Very, uh, very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Craig Kenison from E-A-I-R-D. Your line is open. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Thank you for taking my questions, and congratulations on uh, the quarter as well. wanted to follow up on Robin's question, just so I understand the retail comment regarding Q3. Seb, I think that you said um, not to the level of Q3 of last year. Did you mean the level of growth last year or the absolute level of retail? The level of growth last year. Thank you. And then wanted to dig into your uh, survey, which is really interesting on, on first-time riders. And um, uh, do you have any data on the follow-through of first-time riders? I'm imagining that people who buy a, uh, maybe an ORV or some uh, power sports equipment tend to buy one for the family, but may buy more as time moves on. So one question is just, what's the follow-through typically of a first-time buyer? either buying a new unit to replace that unit or adding units to the garage because it's such a great activity. But like we said on, our, um, on the slide that we had in the package, 23% uh, of our customer purchase in Q3 in Q2 are existing uh, customers. And this is lower because we had a surge of new entrants uh, in the quarter. But there is no doubt, uh, Craig, that uh, we are all surprised by uh, this uh, surge of new entrants, and we're doing everything we can to uh, give them an uh, idea how to ride our product, to do cross-product uh, selling, and to encourage them to ride in different environments. Then this is uh, our marketing effort, and we believe that opportunity will be there for, I don't know, I think we always knew that we were competing against leisure. And when I say leisure, I'm not, we're not a specialist, but if we take cruise, airline, and amusement park, uh, this is huge industry, uh, and they are significantly down. 
then I think there is an opportunity there that uh, will remain for probably a few years. And, and you, the analysts, say that it will take three years to those industry to go back to normal. Then uh, right now our effort is to make sure that we make those customer lifetime customers. Thank you. And then again, regarding your survey, I'm wondering to what extent you tapped into the behavior of your core riders. And specifically, I'm wondering whether some of your existing riders who might have been in the market to replace their unit this year, maybe instead just said, I'm going to ride this year, no need to compete with everyone else to buy units that are scarce in the channel. Because I'm really wondering whether that customer deferred demand in the, in the next year, perhaps, which would create a more sustainable trend going forward. Yeah, I don't have, Craig, top of mind that level of detail. I'm sure our team uh, has it, but uh, for me, uh, I, I don't have it at the top of our mind. Maybe one interesting data we can give you, and, and again, it's not for Q2, it's from March 15 to the end of July. Uh, the number of uh, people who purchase uh, who are between 18 and 44 years old, uh, the number of people increased by 49% versus last year. Women, again, from March 15 to the end of July, plus 63%. And family, people who purchase a product to use it with family, plus 53%. Then it's, it's coming new and trend, and we're attracting a more divar, diverse customer base, which we believe is very healthy for everyone in the industry. Great. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Brian Morrison from TD Securities. Your line is open. Please go ahead. Hi. Good morning. I just have a couple of follow-ups with specifics to prior questions. So uh, maybe for Seb, in terms of the dealer catch-up with dealer inventory being down 51%, can you maybe just give us the dollar value of that uh, to get back up to the optimal level? for power sports overall and, and maybe specifically for PWC? Well, it, if you look at the uh, the outstanding inventory that that's there and it's disclosed that we have on our balance sheet, I mean, we're down almost a billion dollars in terms of uh, inventory uh, in the network. And so in terms of dollar figure, that, that's, that's what it represents. So it's quite sizable in terms of reduction. Okay. And then in terms of your CapEx, it's going to be at all-time levels for next year. I presume that's greater than $400 million. Yes, that's fair. Okay. And in terms of your leverage, uh, your commentary about reviewing the dividend or NCIB, uh, w what would your target leverage be, assuming you have visibility going forward? Well, we've operated pretty much in the range of a net debt to a bit double two times, and that's an area we're comfortable and in going into the crisis that provided us with flexibility of getting additional financing. And so obviously we'll, we'll continue having discussions with the board on what's the optimal uh, leverage level. but lesson learned was that at these levels and with the type of debt structure that we had in place with a covenant light and long-term maturity was something that uh, served us well during uh, the last few months and i think it's something that we will try to preserve going forward okay and then last question just in terms of uh, obviously power sports very well but also marine the boat sales were uh, incredibly strong as well just maybe an update on the boat inventory as well where you stand on that front yeah, the boat inventory declined a bit, uh, but uh, not as drastic as what we had in the power sport business. Uh, declined by about 25%. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Greg Badish Kenya from Wolf Research. Your line is open. Please go ahead. Hey guys, good morning. It's actually Fred Whiteman on for Greg. If we look at the three key retail color that you guys gave, that, that was really helpful. But how should we think about market share against that backdrop? Should we expect more share loss into next quarter? It all depends on uh, on the inventory position of our competitors, and that's something we do not have visibility on. Uh, <coughs> obviously, as I said, we believe we started with a leaner inventory position going into this crisis because our retail was super strong uh, in January, February, and March, uh, where we outperformed the industry and even outperformed what our expectations were. Our, our, our units uh, flew off the shelf, uh, if I can say, early uh, in April and May. 
Uh, we were shut down for uh, a few weeks longer than most of our competitors, and so it's all a question of inventory replenishment. But when we look at our situation going in, we were a market leader. Uh, we had the innovative products. We have a great dealer value proposition. And so there might be some share loss driven by inventory availability in the short term, but we believe that um, when uh, things come back to more normal and we're able to meet demand with our capacity, uh, that will continue that momentum going forward. I would like to put a, a bit of colors on this. Uh, uh, at international level, where we had enough inventory because we had shipped prior the shutdown, uh, we gained market share. We've lost some market share in North America because the timing of the production shutdown and the shipment uh, was for North America. But we don't talk massive uh, numbers. Huh? We're talking a point or two here and there. Uh, and it's something that we believe we will catch up when the right level of inventory uh, will be there because the fundamental of our strategy didn't change. Uh, and it's about product. It's about the value proposition for the dealer, and that has not changed. Okay, that's, that's fair. Um, maybe just simplistically, given the inventory destocking and the retail momentum, why aren't you guys expecting more top-line growth in the back half of the year? Is the way to think about it that it's really just sales and shipments shifting into next year, given some of the disruption? Or, um, you know, what is, what is sort of the way to, to frame that? Well, that's one of the big elements where we're shifting more units uh, for the upcoming season into fiscal year 22. And the other one is international where we need to replenish inventory. We finished the second quarter very lean, both in yard and in transit inventory. Obviously the ship something in Australia, there's a few weeks on the water that you need to factor. Uh, and so there's that element as well, uh, just rebuilding that inventory in our yards, just to be able to uh, supply to demand. Great. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Martin Landry from Stifle GMP. Your line is open. Please go ahead. Hi. Good morning. Um, my first question is on the on the supply chain. Obviously, with uh, with COVID, um, everybody in the supply chain has been stretched, and and I'm wondering if you can give us some color as to how the situation has evolved this summer, and how confident you are that um, you know uh, supply chain is solid to help you out, uh, for instance, capture the, uh, the, 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 the strong snowmobile season coming up? Yeah, good morning, Martin. Uh, for sure, I mean, it's, it's a rocky, it's a rock and roll here for the people in, the, in operation. I mean, in Canada, you had the railway blockage in the spring. We had the Port of Montreal last month. Uh, we had California supplier were shutting down a long period of time. Then. But at the end of the day, we've been able to overcome all those uh, those difficulty. Uh, Sometimes we could have uh, back order parts for a day or two. We prefer to assemble back order and uh, 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 put the, pat the parts on the vehicle a few days later. But overall, uh, we are able to manage the situation. And like uh, we said, uh, if there is a few hiccup like this uh, in the back half, we believe it's manageable. Obviously, uh, if uh, a country would shut down for a month, uh, that could be more difficult, but we cannot plan for this. And we plan in, we're planning for some hiccup, but uh, uh, not a big uh, shutdown. And so far, uh, the team have done a great job to manage it. Okay, thank you. And I, I may have missed this, but um, you're, you're, you're guiding for marine revenues to be down 25 to 30 percent uh, this year. Um, if we exclude um, Evinrude, what, what would that look like? Well, Evinrude's full year is about $140 million uh, reduction. Last year was a $200 million impact on our revenues. And so if you, this year will be, obviously we sold some units in the first quarter. Uh, and so net is about 140 million. So, so, so the, the the shortfall in revenues this year is 140 million dollars. Yeah. So all okay. of it is to onboard engine. Okay. 
And, and last question on your on your customer survey. Um, you know, you're saying 40% are new to the uh, industry. What is usually um, the proportion of, of new customers in the industry in, in normal conditions? Uh, it's a, well, at, I, okay, I'm not sure 100%, but I think it's one third of that. So a third of 40%? Yeah. Okay. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Cameron Dirksen from National Bank Financial. Your line is open. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks. Good, good morning. I just wanted to dig maybe a little bit further into the, the margins uh, in the quarter. Norm, normally Q2 would be, a, I guess, a lower margin quarter for you. Obviously, there were a lot of puts and takes uh, this quarter, but I don't know if you can provide any more, I guess, color around, you know, if we were to look ahead to next year in a Q2, I mean, is a 25% gross margin, I guess, adjusted, something that's that's an achievable number in a kind of a normal year, whatever that may be, but I, I just, you know, any kind of, uh, I guess, color you can sort of put around what, uh, what a sort of a more normalized margin might be here going forward. Yeah, good morning. Let me, uh, what I'll do is probably give you, obviously there's noise, as you said, between Q1 and Q2, and so I'll give you the full picture for the six months of the year. Uh, so last year we were at uh, 22.5, uh, and six months this year we're at 23, before any OE wind down or COVID impact. Uh, so about a, about a 50 basis point improvement. Uh, volume was negative, so I'm we hope that's going to go away next year. Uh, the plus that we got was on the sales program. So for a full six months, is about 120 basis point positive impact. It all depends on how next year is going to go. Are we going to see that benefit, let's say, of about 100 basis points next year on our gross margin because of a, a still a good demand for our products and a less competitive environment uh, where less non-current inventory? So still early to call what next year is going to be like in terms of gross margin, but with better capacity utilization and potentially uh, better sales programs, uh, we might see a 100 basis point improvement in margin on a full year basis. Okay, and, and is there any of the, I guess, the sort of the cost savings you've achieved outside of the selling and marketing, are, are some of these more, more permanent as you've learned to do things more efficiently? Um, you know, maybe there's more remote work, uh, things like that. I'm just wondering if you can talk about sort of more permanent cost reductions. Well, the important one is the our decision to exit the outboard engine business. Right. As we said uh, in Q1, it's about a 60 to 70 uh, cent TPS impact. This year, we should probably get about a 40 cent benefit of it, and that's going to obviously roll over the next year, and we'll get the full year benefit. Uh, that uh, comes from uh, obviously the the saving comes from operating expenses that are going away. Um, and yes, there are some lessons learned, but obviously we are focused on growing this business. And so there's no no big cost saving from working from home. I mean, there's a structure that's in place that needs to be supported. Uh, we'll have some employees be working more remote next year, but a lot of them will still be in our premises, hopefully. Um, and obviously, we continue focusing on on being efficient in how we run the business, and that's part of our, uh, what we do every year. So we'll uh, we'll continue driving uh, margin improvement. Okay, great. And, and just finally, from me, uh, just shifting gears, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the the used market for off road vehicles and uh, and uh, personal watercraft, maybe snowmobiles as well. I mean, our understanding is that uh, there's very low availability of of used. Uh, product out there in the market, uh, so I'm wondering if if you have any data on on that. What you know, what the sales of used products have been. Uh, I know it might be difficult to to track, but uh, any data on that, and and what you think that means for new product sales as we look ahead to next year. Yeah, as you said, we don't have any data of uh, the the inventory out there by region, but one thing is sure. I mean, uh, we heard a lot of dealers saying they are empty. Watercraft was totally empty uh, this summer in North America, and I believe it's the same thing for our froze snowmobile. The season is just starting, but uh, I was talking to a dealer Saturday, and uh, there is a surge of customer at the dealership right now, and obviously the salespeople are saying buy now because we'll be out of inventory soon. Then 
I think it's it's all of this is very healthy for the industry uh, and uh, for the dealers, and uh, we'll all gain from it. Okay, no, that that's great. That's all for me. Thanks very much. Yep. Thank you. The next question is from Derek Billy from Canaccord Genui. Your line is open. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, thanks. Um, just one for me. In terms of, you know, given the, the strong demand pull forward here that we've seen, um, are you guys seeing any changes, you know, early stages here in terms of dealer order patterns? Like, are, are dealers looking now to potentially hold more, you know, product on, on their floors just given the, the really strong demand that they're seeing? Uh, good morning, Derek. I mean, first, uh, we believe that, uh, in general, dealer uh, don't like inventory, and uh, some were complaining we had too much inventory. They had too much inventory before the COVID. Then we believe that this this whole surge of demand could give us an opportunity. When I say us, the dealer and us, to maybe lower a bit the inventory uh, in the network. It will take a while before we get there, but this is an opportunity that uh, all of us together, uh, the other OEM, the dealer and us, uh, will run leaner on inventory and be more efficient. But it will take a while before uh, we get there. Uh, okay, no, that's helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question is from Jamie Kapp from Morningstar. Your line is open. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Can you um, give us a little bit more color in the Canadian market? It looks like the sales there or the shipments uh, decelerated a little bit faster than some of the other geographies, and I'm wondering if maybe um, it has re-accelerated and caught up to the other geographies as the end of the quarter. Thanks. Hey, good morning, Jamie. Uh, yeah, Canada was down in the quarter, obviously coming from one, the, the leaner inventory and, and the shipments of personal watercraft that we had to reduce. But the other big factor is uh, is timing in snowmobile shipments. Uh, we ship less snowmobiles in the second quarter than um, than last year. Uh, these are units that we'll be shipping in the uh, third and fourth quarter. Okay. And then for the Unchartered Society um, program that you mentioned earlier, are you guys basically loaning units to these providers? And then if that's the case, are there some shipments um, that are sizable, maybe that we should think about as this is initiated, you know, relative to what it's going to look like next year shipping into that program. Uh, first, definitely, I mean, uh, we we partner with people that uh, we believe are the best in the industry, and obviously they use our product, but we don't think it's meaningful uh, in the overall thing. Uh, they, they have a fleet of vehicles that they turn uh, probably once a year. Uh, but uh, it's not meaningful in the whole thing. Thank you. Thank you. The last question is from Derek Johnson from BMO Capital Markets. Your line is open. Please go ahead. Great. Thank you. Uh, the last three questions. Uh, so first question, uh, your decision, well, the announcement on the new factory was made in uh, early July. So when when was that decision made? Was that something you were contemplating, you know, pre-COVID back, you know, January, February, or is that something that, uh, you know, the, the, the demand you've seen since the uh, pandemic, did that trigger that decision? Good morning, Derek. I mean, as we've said, I, I, I mean, we were part of the analyst call uh, last September. Uh, we were starting to plan for it. Obviously, when the COVID thing happened in mid-March, we put everything on hold, but when we saw the surge in demand, we uh, have uh, uh, restart the program. Then it was planned. That's something that with the growth that we had pre-COVID, that's something that uh, we did it anyhow, but uh, that's why in the middle of all this, uh, we decided to announce and move forward. Okay, great. And then uh, follow up on Fred's question. Uh, for the second half, you know, sales to be flat to up seven. Uh, can you talk about other variables uh, that would go into uh, that guidance, specifically um, thinking about uh, the retail demand you're expecting and also where you are planning on dealer inventories to end up at the end of uh, uh, in January, at the end of the year? 
yeah, as we said, we're very focused on on producing uh, as many units as we can in the second quarter. There's going to be a, an international inventory replenishment, which I, I mentioned about. One item we didn't talk about is, is parts and accessory. Um, they performed very, very well in the second quarter, uh, obviously driven by the strong demand in our products. Uh, it was soft in the first quarter. It was actually down in the first quarter, uh, impacted by COVID. And so are there opportunities there for the second half of the year? Our guidance calls for, let's say, down 2 to up 7%. Um, some of it in the second quarter was probably a, a tailwind, i.e. dealers being closed in the first quarter and more, uh, more cautious, more cautious uh, planning from them. So we'll see where that ends. Um, but uh, we certainly like to see the performance that we had in Q2 continue, and uh, and the team is very focused on uh, on making sure we deliver a strong growth on the pack side. Okay. Well, you, Jose mentioned earlier uh, that you're going to run leaner, uh, run leaner on inventory. So does that mean the optimal level of dealer inventory is is lower than it had been, you know, in the past? Well, in absolute, again, depends on the overall industry and the number of days. Uh, could we reduce the overall number of days by, let's say, 25%? Yes, but does it mean that the inventory is going to go down by 25%? Probably not, because obviously the industries are growing, our market share is growing. So that's something we need to factor in when we look at the overall total inventory. But Jose's comment was more in terms of reducing the number of days out there. Okay. And then my last one is a little bit more specificity on the, um, on the cost savings. You, know, you outlined on the last call 450 million of, of total savings. I guess the ongoing number, excluding Evan Ruby, about 370 million. That was from you know uh, overhead costs uh, that you were taking out through layoffs, hiring freezes, salary reductions. Uh, now, where are we now? Are those costs coming back online? I'd assume that that 370 number uh, would be lower. What what's the number of cost savings to expect going forward? Yeah, well, you saw, let's say for, uh, and we'll look at OPEX for the first half of the year, we, uh, when you compare year over year, it's an $80 million saving that we have. When we talked about the 450, was 450 versus our original plan for fiscal year 21, uh, not a year over year reduction. Uh, I'm expecting Q3 OPEX to also be down as we continue f seeing the benefit of the cost reductions. Uh, but obviously, as the business is uh, much better than what we were anticipating and the outlook for next year as well is favorable, we, uh, we need to continue to invest in growth. And so Q4, I'm expecting OPEX to be flat year over year. Okay. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank you. There are no further questions at this time, so I will return the meeting over to you. Great. Thanks, everyone, for joining us this morning, and we look forward to speaking with you again on November 25th for our third quarter results. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. The conference has now ended. Please disconnect your lines at this time, and we thank you for your participation.